previously on Xyla Foxland's YouTube channel. This boat has to go in a U-Haul tomorrow because tomorrow I'm moving to California. When I was a little kid, my favorite thing was scissors because that was the only tool I really had. So I really liked scrapbooking. But now I'm a big kid with my own credit card and no self-control when it comes to power tools. So in my move across the country, I thought it would be fun to, instead of scrapbook it, collect a piece of wood in every single state that I visit and turn it all into a map of my trip. And the only rule I set for myself is that that tree had to have been grown in the state that I got it in. So without further ado, oh wait, before further ado, is that a thing? Before further ado, if you want to learn how to own a piece of the map that I've made or contribute wood from your own state, make sure you hang tight until the end. And also subscribe and like and hit the bell and all that jazz. Okay, now let's hit the rim. Graves Lumberyard in Kentucky, and I just got the first piece of wood for my cross-country project. This building is incredibly cool. I think it's an abandoned school, and it's just filled with like tons and tons of drying wood. The Kentucky coffee tree is a pale and fairly dense wood and grows natively primarily in the American Midwest. Its name comes from these pods, which Native Americans roasted into a coffee-like drink, but of course we whitewashed the named coffee because this is America after all. Anyway, I don't recommend drinking it as they're toxic unless properly roasted and you probably don't know how to properly roast them. But fun fact, the Kentucky coffee tree was the Kentucky state tree from 1976 to 1994, which unfortunately means that the tulip tree has been their state tree for my entire lifetime, but maybe not yours. Anyway, this is actually my third attempt at laser cutting this and I ended up having to go back and resaw the piece a little bit thinner uh, because it was denser than I expected. The laser cutter really struggled, but we did get there in the end. And off we head to our next stop, the great state of Tennessee. Whoa, hold up Zyla, you can't just go to Tennessee without introducing the sponsor of today's video. Wait, I can't? No, you're already on the road using public Wi-Fi everywhere without using a VPN. You need Surfshark and you need to introduce it to your viewers. Surfshark is a VPN or a virtual private network and it's available as an easy to use app or browser extension that lets you pretend you're accessing a network from anywhere in the world. Which lets you access and unblock websites and content you might not usually be able to see, but it also encrypts all of your data, adding an extra level of security to keep all of your private info safe. This is great for when you're on public Wi-Fi on a road trip, for example, because those public networks are a gold mine for hackers. You know, we can't have anyone seeing that I spend all my time watching videos about hammering and screwing hard wood, if you know what I mean. Anyway, Surfshark offers one account to use on an unlimited number of devices, plus a 30-day money-back guarantee, so there's no risk to try it out for yourself. Get Surfshark VPN at surfshark.deals slash Xyla for 83% off and three whole months free. All right, go have fun on your road trip and I'll see you in California. I found this really cool wood store called Smoky Mountain Vintage Lumber, and they happen to have some reclaimed American chestnut salvaged from a hundred year old barn that had just been taken down. Now, this was an incredible find because for those of you who don't know, the American chestnut tree has been functionally extinct for generations. It's estimated that at the start of the 1900s, there was nearly 4 billion American chestnuts growing in the Eastern United States, meaning one in every four trees in the Appalachian forests was a chestnut. The trees were suffocated from the inside out by a fungal blight imported on Asian chestnuts, which was just being planted as decoration. And starting around 1904-ish, in just 40 years, the species was almost entirely wiped out. Now, American chestnut is a very strong straight-grained hardwood with a ton of tannins in it, meaning it's highly resistant to decay, making it extremely useful for things like telephone poles, piers, railroads, pretty much all construction, particularly home and barn construction, shingles, fences, like literally everything. Plus, it grows significantly faster than oak. A timberman once said, by the time an oak produced a baseball bat, a chestnut had a railroad tie. They were nicknamed the sequoias of the east, growing to a diameter of over 10 feet and a height of over 10 stories tall. When you're singing about chestnuts roasting on an open fire, it's because the nuts were a critical part of the food ecosystem in the area for wildlife, livestock, and humans alike, especially to get through the winter. 
Now there's potentially hope, as a lot of research has been done on developing a blight-resistant chestnut tree, and a genetically modified American chestnut tree has been submitted to the U.S. Department of Agriculture for reforestation. But that too carries a huge amount of risk, so only time will tell if our children will get to see the famous chestnuts blooming across the Appalachians once more. Before moving on with the trip though, I spent the weekend enjoying the fall foliage and hiking around the Great Smoky Mountains, which I'd never gotten to see before. And definitely my favorite hike was the Rainbow Falls Trail up to the summit of Mount Leconte, which actually might have been my favorite hike of this entire road trip. And that's despite this. You know that moment when you spend all day hiking up a mountain and then there's no view? <laughs> it's gone. I guess this is why they call it the Smoky Mountains. <laughs> But wow, did the views on the way up and down make it worth it. It's not often you get to just hang out in a cloud without having to pay for airplane time. And I must say, it's kind of hard to drive through Dollywood without paying a little bit of a tribute to Dolly herself. But after a few days of feeling like I was living in a Henry David Thoreau poem, it was time to hit the road and actually start heading west this time. Which did mean that I finally got to spend a night in Nashville like I've always wanted, although because of COVID I didn't actually get to do anything, so I'm just hoping that one of my friends has a bachelorette party there or something. Katie, I'm looking directly at you. And then of course the GoPro died right before we were about to cross into the Arkansas border, so this is the best footage you're gonna get of that. We spent a morning at Hot Springs National Park, which unfortunately the hot springs were closed because of COVID, so we did a little bit of hiking, and then we went and visited Remembered Hill Sawmill and Farm. And Jeremiah was the best. We talked about everything from helicopters to poetry to trees, and he passionately told me about the shortleaf yellow pine. It's most prevalent in western Arkansas around the Wichita Mountains, and it makes great timber, but unfortunately it's slow growing, and so when lumber companies bulldozed forests of them for the wood, they were replaced with their much faster growing counterparts. Jeremiah walked me over to the last shortleaf pine on his property, one that remains only because it's in the backyard of the farmhouse and not on the timberland. Three hours of chatting later, he finally pointed us towards nearby Lake Wichita, where camping was free, and I finally got to take my canoe out for its very first overnight camping trip. And waking up at dawn on the water is an experience that is absolutely unbeatable. If you've never had the opportunity, I highly recommend try to find a way to get out there and experience canoeing and nature like this. And I could have stayed out there for weeks, but unfortunately we had several thousand more miles to cover. So we pointed our bow towards Oklahoma and started paddling. But well, we, we drove, obviously. Duh. And I gotta say, Oklahoma might win worst welcome to our state sign of the trip. Like that's the sign, that. Anyway, Oklahoma had this really cute park and also this really cute low water bridge, which was my first ever low water bridge, by the way. And also this really cute waterfall, which they've named Little Niagara, and I find that to be a little bit of a hyperbole, but I'll keep quiet. They also have, and I won't say cute because I think it might offend them, this really great sawmill called Shawnee Sawmill, where I picked up a piece of persimmon as my Oklahoma wood. I had never heard of persimmon as a wood before, only its delicious fruit, but it was the American ebony and was once very sought out for loom shuttles and golf clubs. It was kind of a gnarly wood to work with, but in the end it was very dense and it came out beautifully. And that evening we crossed into Texas and spent the night in Amarillo. Texas. 
And I think when you're passing through Amarillo, it's illegal to not stop at Cadillac Ranch. So we, of course, had to, you know, do our American duty and swing by and spray paint something stupid and then leave. And also while in Amarillo, I picked up a piece of mesquite as my Texas wood. And I went to a lumber yard, but they actually had no lumber that was grown in Texas because not a lot of lumber is grown in Texas. So we picked this one out of the barbecue firewood pile. This piece starting its life as firewood does mean that the first step had to be to make it look a little more like dimensional lumber. But luckily I had a friend with a jointer, so I ran two faces uh, along the jointer to square them up and then resawed the piece. Unfortunately, another side effect of it being firewood is that it had a lot of cracks because it wasn't dried in a way that was meant to be used for lumber. So my first attempt at resawing broke, but the second one was good. All right, so here's a problem that I knew was coming is that Texas does not fit on the piece of mesquite that I have. Every other state in the United States fits on these piece of wood, except for Texas. <laughs> because Texas is, okay, do you wanna say, this is Texas. This is Delaware. Just look at the size difference. So I think I'm going to, and I actually really like this sapwood, so I think I'm just gonna cut this here and then just sort of glue the two together and accept that Texas will have a seam, a seam down the middle. All right, I'm so nervous because if I learned anything from the last couple days of laser failures, it's that the laser cutter really can only handle like eighth inch wood. And this is far too thick, but it's also like how thick I needed it to be to glue it up. So I'm gonna run it through the planer, which just feels very risky because I don't really have another one. So wish me luck. The laser very nearly made it through, so I just sanded back to the handful of spots where it didn't and popped it out. And I was really looking forward to this part of the trip because at this point we met up with historic and depressingly abandoned Route 66. Route 66, or the Mother Road, was built in the 1920s and was one of the very first highways in America. It ran from Chicago to Los Angeles and was the primary route for westward travelers for decades, creating a booming economy of mom and pop shops and small towns along the route to serve travelers. But following World War II, the U.S. realized its need for an interstate system at Germany's level, so President Eisenhower passed the Federal Aid Highway Act of 1956, which funded the construction of I-40, a paved interstate, which now runs much of the original Route 66 route, but the interstate bypassed all of those small towns, leading to the scenes you're seeing here. This newspaper says First Lady Hillary Clinton. And to wrap up our day on Route 66, we made it to Sandia Crest in Albuquerque just in time to watch the sun set. The next morning, I headed over to meet Lauren Pacho, an Instagram friend who is an incredible cedar ship boat builder and check out the detailing that she puts on her vessels. And then I swung by Albuquerque Exotic Woods to pick up a piece of alligator juniper, which was the only wood that they had that was actually grown in New Mexico. And that's gonna be a theme of the next several states. It's very difficult to find woods grown in the desert. It was a breeze to work with though, and one of the prettiest woods, I think, of the lot, and it smelled great, but I just resawed it, sanded it, and then laser cut it, no problem. It was not particularly hard, so the laser didn't have a hard time. And from Albuquerque, we embarked on the classic American Southwest National Parks road trip, starting with Mesa Verde and Colorado. And not only could I not find any sawmills in the area of Mesa Verde, it was also a Sunday, so I was sort of doubly screwed, but luckily I found this truck full of firewood for sale and picked up a piece of a northern white cedar. Just like Texas, it needed to be cut down and jointed 
uh, before it was resawed, but other than that, it was smooth sailing, and cedar is such an easy wood to work with. And the funny thing about driving into Utah is you're immediately greeted by strange rock formations on the side of the road that would probably be a national park in like any other state. But in Utah, it's just, you know, a rock on the side of the road. We spent a day hiking around Arches before heading to Escalante National Monument, which is like the most underrated park ever. It was absolutely stunning and looked like alien formations everywhere. And we found this beautiful acoustic canyon. This is my variation on a waltz my uncle wrote called Belle Michelle. I'll link it below. And then I found these really strange mountains that looked like someone had run a planer over them. But I guess it's fine because I also found the shavings. But anyway, Bryce was mind-bogglingly beautiful and Zion was equally mind-bogglingly beautiful, but unfortunately in neither of those places are an abundance of sawmills. So eventually after several days in Utah and finding nowhere to acquire wood, I gave up and bought a slab of petrified wood at a rock shop. Now this proved to be quite a challenge for someone who only owns woodworking tools, but luckily I turned to Twitter and I ended up finding a fan with an awesome lapidary shop not far from LA. We were pretty much able to accomplish everything using the rock slab saw, so first we trimmed off the excess and then we ran each edge down the saw, resawing about a quarter of an inch and then just cut it into shape. And I gotta say, cutting rocks is a soggy process. Let us never ever be And then it was direct to Vegas, which very unfortunately included a 30 mile stretch of Arizona. We only have 27 minutes from the Utah border to the Nevada border. How the heck do I find wood in the middle of a desert in 27 minutes on an interstate? I haven't seen a single tree since we entered the state of Arizona. Not a single tree. Like that shrub doesn't count as a tree. Needless to say, I unfortunately did not get a piece from Arizona, but I was able to score a Nevada piece of cottonwood. Cottonwood is a cool tree. It's technically a poplar that lives in the riparian zones of the Southwest, meaning it only lives along streams and rivers. It's a staple stunner of country songs and romanticized road trips for that reason, but it's also a very soft, light, and easy to work with wood with a really pretty grain. I'd never even heard of it as a lumber before, but I was very pleasantly surprised. It was a lot of fun. And after a night in Vegas with some college friends where we all managed to all you can eat ourselves sick, it was time to buckle up and drive the last four hours to LA. Greetings from California, everybody. This is Aaron and he's letting me use his shop and it's, you know, a Friday night because that's when you go over to people's houses to use their shops. <laughs> that's right, COVID. And this is a piece of red gum eucalyptus that was harvested in Altadena, so up north from Pasadena area. It's all yours. Sweet, so there's my California wood. My very last piece of this puzzle. Aaron is an awesome maker who I also found on Twitter and he let me use his shop a couple times during this project because I did resaw everything and then my laser couldn't cut through it so I had to come back and resaw everything thinner. Anyway, it was pointed out to me that red gum eucalyptus is an invasive species in California so although this does meet my map rule requirement of having been grown in the state, uh, I do have a fan sending me a piece of redwood from Northern California, just so that we don't have any invasive species. Do you have anything you want to plug? Uh, you can find me on Instagram and Twitter, <laughs> at Hagrid Aaron. At Hagrid Aaron, all right. Yeah. 
And with all the wood collected, it was time to actually build the thing. Okay, so here's my dilemma. Basically, the piece of sheet metal I got that all of the magnets will stick to is too flimsy on its own. And so that means I have to make a frame for it. But luckily I've got all of this stuff. And this is all reclaimed cedar I got from a Facebook Marketplace post right after I moved here actually. And it's architectural salvage from a mansion in Beverly Hills. And from what I can tell, it's actually, I think, Western red cedar, which is the same stuff you build canoes out of. I'm saving these long pieces in case I maybe want to build a canoe or a kayak out of it. Um, but these shorter pieces, I think I'm gonna use for the frame. So I basically just need to plane them down. Problem is using the planer means acknowledging that I exist and I have neighbors, so. Greetings from sunny California. Not gonna lie, I just bought this planner on Facebook Marketplace like last week and I don't know how to use it yet, but I don't have time to learn, so I'm just gonna wing it. All right, now that these are all the same width, my friend Alan is letting me use the table saw at his old makerspace because I don't have a table saw yet, as you can see. Um, and I need to put a groove in these for the steel to sit in so that it can be a frame. But I suppose while we're here, we'll do a mini shop tour. Here's some tools. Here's the party kayak up there and some lumber and a miter saw and a bandsaw and a router table and my laser cutter and a little workbench area. Yep, that's my whole shop. So my friend Alan was like, come on down to my makerspace. I'm sure we have a table saw. And I get set up with a mobile table saw in the parking lot. Thanks, Alan. <laughs> it's very janky too, I'm not. In this dramatic camera angle, you can see here a wild side in her natural habitat hunting her prey. 2020 has been a wild year and every table saw blade counts. All right, enough with the antics. I just needed to lower the table saw blade so I could cut a groove. And... I'm done. You filming something? And with the grooves cut, I headed home to cut some miters and make it into a frame. The miters are like not great, but they're really not bad considering that I did not even break out any sort of measuring device to do this. <laughs> it's time to make the map. So I put out yet another call for help on social media. I swear, if you're not following me on Instagram or Twitter, you're missing all of my begging. But anyway, I found Calvin and he helped me vinyl cut this map outline. <laughs> this is a professional, professional weeding. Yeah. Uh... Pro, pro level weeding. <laughs> Almost. Oh, oh, I saw that. <laughs> we could change that in post. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, man. Of course. <laughs> and then I cut all the states out of a really pretty frosted acrylic, and I'll use those as placeholders for the states I haven't been to yet. And then I used the hinge method to stick down the vinyl and then just peel. Now let's just uh, double check that these are in fact the right size. Hey, look at that. And off camera, I put beeswax on the framing pieces and then just used a framing nailer to put it all together. And then I went in and hit all of the wooden states with this polyurethane in this fabulous example of why you should not try to use a mirrorless camera at night, because it can't focus. And lastly, I just glued magnets onto the backs of each state. And you may notice that for the acrylic states, I actually did it where the state capital is, just because they're visible anyway, so I may as well use it to my advantage. with 
all 12 states that I visited on my trip, but obviously there are way more states. But if you can send me wood from your state and I use your wood on my map, I will send in response the acrylic placeholder that I made in the meantime. And if you want, I guess I can sign it, but I don't know if my signature is really worth anything. Uh, just let me know. I guess. But regardless, if I get multiples from a state, I respond to every single piece of fan mail that I get. I have a P.O. box and it's down in the description of this video. So yeah, I have fun sending out postcards and stuff. Send me some wood. That would be awesome. Like this video and subscribe and let me, let me know also if you liked this format. I know I, I fell into a lot of rabbit holes and like channeled my inner Ken Burns for a little while but I had a lot of fun making it and I also would love an excuse to go on another road trip to get more wood. So <laughs> if this was a good format, let me know. Okay, until next time, ciao.